link to the advocacy training for current and former service members. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Sarah Levin. I'm the Director of Grassroots and Community Programs at the Secular Coalition for America, and we are very pleased to host this webinar presented by Jason Torpy, the President of the Military Association of Atheists and Freethinkers, and Jason Lemieux, who is the Director of Government Affairs at the Center for Inquiry. And um, I'm going to turn it over to them uh, in just a second. I wanted to let everyone know that you are able to ask questions during this webinar, there should be a chat box if you are on your computer. Um, and we will have time for Q&A at the end, so we'll be taking note of your questions as we go along. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jason Torpy. Thanks a lot. Um, so we're talking about military history and policy. In particular, we're going to talk about what the policy looks like, what it has in the past, and then what it will be in the future, and the, and the idea is that you have an appreciation for where we've been, and that'll help you to get us to where we want to be in terms of equal rights for humanists in the military. So what this slide shows is a long history of some important milestones to show a history of humanists and other non-theists in the military. And um, this is only recent history related to policy. Never forget that atheists are in foxholes and always have been. MAP, the Military Association of Atheists and Freethinkers, has a long listing of atheists and foxholes with entry back to World War II of those who were at least, at the time, living veterans and able to testify to their service. We honor their memory with, the, with our work and we help out young men and women in uniform trying to honor them and serve the best values of our nation. Um, and, and I'll have a lot of uh, links and, and references. Uh, these slides will be available and you'll, you'll be able to go online and see uh, references and, and investigate all these you know, claims and, and data more uh, when you have time. Uh, we, I'll walk briefly through these important events. Um, the 2010 to 2012 timeframe was most significant. At this time, Matt conducted dedicated outreach, speaking with Pentagon officials in all branches of service in multiple locations on various issues, including at each military academy, the Chaplain Training Center, and at the Pentagon. It was at this time the Department of Defense had every opportunity to embrace diversity and chose not to. They have only reiterated and reinforced this, this exclusionary policy since then. At the, same, at the same time, they have never made any firm, explicit, anti-humanist statements. They operate without integrity, refusing service while presenting the appearance of inclusion. We must expose the reality and support our troops so that they can advocate for their rights. Uh, again, you see some history at the U.S. Air Force Academy in 1995. There's, you know, a certain public image of that as the worst place in the world, but honestly, it's no better or worse than any place else. And we've had for over 20 years now a, a strong uh, cadet humanist pre presence there. So there's a lot of good history there as well. Um, our own organization in 1997 was a discussion group, and, and I created an organization for it in 2001. Uh, in 2007, we had a lot of public public visibility. We had a foxhole atheist essentially run out of Iraq for fear of Christian retribution, not the Muslims or any sort of insurgent activity. They were just afraid that Christians were going to get him because he had an atheist meeting once. Um, we had those chaplain meetings I talked about in 2010 and 2011. Uh, 2012 was the Lackland Air Force uh, base basic training meeting got started. We also had those at different academies and at Navy basic training, but Lackland has been a real success story. The chaplains don't have anything to do with it, but it's over a thousand <coughs> weekly, very often over a thousand people weekly, really the largest humanist gathering in the world. Not to say that every single person there is human. Um, we have the Humanist Society is doing a lot of endorsements and chaplain training, really participating professionally in both the clergy and chaplain profession. So that's really important to understand. We have these people serving all over the world, and we have professional clergy and professional chaplains that are uh, actively involved there. Um, in the future, what we want to do is, is really refer, reform the military chaplaincy or find new leadership and find another approach if, if the chaplains that are working there aren't willing to do things. And I'll talk more about those specific things, about being able to identify as who we are, getting services from chaplains. You know, they're funded to serve everybody, and they serve, serve us too. And of, of course, avoiding proselytism and command endorsement of religion that's inappropriate, while still allowing everybody to have, you know, different services and prayer and worship and all those personal expressions of religion that are good for everybody. So the um, the next slide here 
what you see is a lot of demographics. Um, the first priority is for us to understand that we are relevant. Humanists and other non-theists are a small minority, but not an insignificant one. Even back to 2009, the Defense Equal Opportunity Management Institute found humanists at 3.6%. That was a survey asking for self-identification based on equal opportunity questions. It is a different number than what you see here, but in that survey, Catholic and Baptist were the only specific selection, selections over 4%. Humanist was about the same as Methodist. No religious preference was 25.5%. That's not atheist necessarily, but it is either people in the minority who fear retribution or Christians not affiliated enough to say what they are. On this graph, which you'll, I'll go into more detail, uh, you see uncertain, uh, that category of uncertain, which includes no religious preference, that has grown to 29.6%. To this means the Department of Defense has no idea what nearly 30% of its people believe. It also means that 90% Christian and other such claims are not based in fact. The graph you see here includes the Freedom of Information Act data pulled from the Defense Manpower Data Center. These data are not, uh, are not a survey. They are official self-identified religious preference put in by service members in all branches and components. This is what goes on dog tags. You can find this and other data on the MAP website under Education and Demographics. All data comes with clear sources, dates, and explanations. But what you see here are selections pulled into large category. Sorry about that. Um, what you see are large categories in general Christian, uncertain, including no religious preference, Catholic Christian, evangelistic Christian, theistic spiritual, and non-theist humanist. What you don't see is the meaningless and misleading Christian, Christian Jewish, Muslim, and other that most places use. Also none, that's N-O-N-E, in my opinion, degrades the deeply held beliefs of non-theists. That's another discussion, but I want to highlight uh, the values and beliefs that we do have, hence the non-theist slash humanist category in place of none. Theistic spiritual includes all those vanishingly small non-Christian categories like Hindu, Sikh, Buddhist, Jewish, Muslim, Wiccan, Native American, Pagan, and others. I say vanishingly small not to marginalize their beliefs, but to highlight how many beliefs there are, all of which have recognition and support from the chaplaincy, and all of which, all put together, add up to less than us. Us, in this case, includes atheist, agnostic, and humanist selections. This population was 0.6% in 2009. Again, that's a different method than the 3.6% than the uh, I mentioned earlier. In 2017, the percentage had grown to 1.9%, with all those other theistic options put together at only 1.6%. Be proud, that's a minority, but a significant minority. So the problem is we can't even identify as humanists. I mean, I've, lot, I've been talking a lot about demographics. You'll see, uh, you'll see if you research the math demographics page uh, that there are a lot of caveats there. I do assure you that this re represents capital T truth, not just friendly interpretations of data. But one important point is that our struggle revolves around simply being who we are. All young recruits, normally 18 years old and away from home for the first time, are asked, what's your religion, within a few days of entering military service. This is a major source of anxiety for any non-Christian denomination. We also know that there are zero humanist or officially non-theistic chaplains. This chart shows that very clearly. That is to say that while we while not represented in large numbers, minority beliefs are overrepresented. 3.15% of the chaplain population versus 1.29% of the, of the general population. Catholics are underrepresented, and other slash mainstream Christians are about even. Evangelistic denominations are overrepresented. There are three times as many evangelistic chaplains as compared to the general population. The word evangelistic was created by MAP for this purpose and tra translates approximately to political evangelicals. These are chaplains endorsed by organizations that are more likely to encourage chaplains to be politically active, convert military personnel, shame personnel who don't conform to the organization's religious or moral beliefs, and certainly they are unlikely to support non-theists. That is the intention of the category. As a, disc as a disclaimer, MAP has added this caveat to the demographic information and invites any organizations in this category to object. The Coalition of Spirit-Filled Churches is the only organization to speak up and has shown itself to avoid all of those concerns. Hence, it is in the other Christian category. No others have objected since the original publication with 2009 data, so we consider the categories pretty solid. 
It's not so much our concern that these evangelistic chaplains are so extremely overpopulated relative to the general population. The concern is that all of these chaplains, two-thirds of the chaplain's corps, chaplain corps, are hostile to the vast majority of the military population. That is, the 80% who don't share their beliefs. Certainly included are the population of non-theists, atheists, agnostics, and humanists. We have a common cause with the vast majority of military personnel of diverse beliefs, including theists, when we seek up for chaplain reform. Our voice should advocate for men and women who serve, gays and lesbians, and transgender service members. It is sometimes not considered within the realm of secular policy to advocate for diverse groups other than non-theists. However, we have a situation where powerful, well-funded government officials and military chaplains are using their government authority to enforce their religious beliefs about those other diversity groups. That is a violation of secular governance that we should step in to oppose. Of obvious concern here is that there are no humanist chaplains. Several organizations would meet military requirements to endorse chaplains, including the Society for Humanistic Judaism, American Ethical Union, and the Humanist Society. All these are organized as churches under, according to IRS requirements and thus would meet the requirements to, to endorse chaplains. However, the Department of Defense denies new endorsers access to current milita military chaplains who wish, to convert, uh, who wish to convert from some other belief. Uh, student chaplains, any candidate who might need a waiver for education, age, or health, and any candidate for reserve or National Guard status. Hence, the pool is restricted only to non-serving, perfect, active duty candidates. This is a high bar that is keeping out humanists and other minority denominations. The military's only Hindu chaplain in history came into the military as a Christian and later converted. The restriction against using currently serving chaplains was added following the Hindu conversion as Christian chaplains blocked a potential avenue for more diverse chaplains to enter military service. Not surprisingly, military chaplains who, who convert to some accepted faith like Protestant or Jewish have no restriction. But if a Christian or Jewish chaplain ser currently serving honorably were to convert to humanism, that chaplain would lose their job purely due to their religious beliefs. So a common response to chaplains among non-theists is to say they are unconstitutional. And this is untrue. Chaplains have been ruled constitutional many times in various ways, and there is no effort or sense in trying to challenge that. Please put the idea aside. However, that applies to theoretical constitution, constitutionality. Were chaplains to support everyone equally, then there would be no problem. The chart you see here shows the various valuable services chaplains provide. The purpose of chaplains is to provide for religious, moral, and spiritual services for everyone in the unit. That term spiritual can set humanists on edge, but this sh should be read as dealing with life, love, loss, grief, stress, and the like. It means dealing with those issues and not, not in a purely cynical... Jason, Torby, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you just cut out a little bit. Do you mind kind of going back to um, when you were saying um, that the... The services, it would be fine if everyone had the same services, but that's not the case because that's when you started to cut out a little bit. Okay. Okay. Um, so we were talking about theoretical constitutionality. You know, they're constitutional theoretically, um, or chaplains to support everyone equally. The chart you see here shows the various valuable services chaplains provide. The purpose of those of chaplains is to provide for religious, moral, and spiritual services for everyone in the unit. And that term spiritual can set humanists on edge, but this should be read as dealing with life, love, loss, grief, stress, and the like. It means dealing with those issues not in a purely clinical, psychological way, but by relying on meaning and community of like mind. These are important services to rely on to rely on in the military where hard work, long hours, and high stress in non-combat situations is common. And I hope we can all recognize how much more important those coping mechanisms are in combat situations. So theoretically, chaplains are invaluable contributors to the functioning of the military team. In practice, as you can see from this chart, they do a decent job of providing for various, various different denominations. The Protestant is in red because chaplains can arguably go above and beyond in those areas often providing 20 or 30 weekly services for Protestants, while providing just a few services among all the rest. Humanist is in red because we get basically nothing. Temporary service, temporary areas for services is listed in green, 
because chaplains or these are places to meet um, because chaplains have provided those for humanist services. Uh, the truth is this is almost unheard of, but it has happened, hence the green light. But if anything, it shows how generous this chart is, that we're giving credit even for that. All of these lights should be green for every denomination. That is valuable in constitutional chaplaincy. The reality for humanists is we are turned away almost invariably. Even though those events MAF has fostered around the country are done most often with no chaplain assistance at all. That is discrimination and calls for reform, reorganization, or a fundamental rethinking of the chaplaincy. One thing that bothers me personally is when people say, oh, my chaplain is good. What that normally means is the chaplain smiled and had a talk. Being personally pleasant is basic human decency. Decency is necessary but not sufficient for professional chaplaincy. Remember this chart. Ask yourself if, uh, ask yourself if these nice guy chaplains, uh, if they have any humanist meetings on the schedule or if they ever hosted one. Ask if they have any humanist materials on display or even on hand. Ask what actual humanist leaders they have, uh, they have contact with. If they can't provide good answers to all these questions, they are not doing enough. If, as is most common, they answer no to all of these questions, then they are part of the problem. And I will only add the caveat that barely a handful of chaplains can answer yes to any of these questions. So the problem is not with any one chaplain, but with chaplain leadership. The easy reform for chaplains is to simply say yes. Yes to the diversity of belief calling for their help, influence, and resources. Say yes to the Christians, but also say yes to the Wiccans, humanists, Muslims, and others who are marginalized or excluded entirely. That is the easy fix, but chaplains have thus far not opened their hearts to humanists. So chaplains currently enjoy unrestricted access to commanders and military personnel as well as rank and benefits of official military officers. They are on, on the personal staff of the commander with no barrier at all to the commander's ear. Chaplains frequently open, open meetings, even daily staff meetings with prayer. This cannot help but affect the commander's policy and promotions. Chaplain billets are assigned to every military commander who oversees more than a few hundred troops. Chaplains additionally assi are assigned to most installation command activities, which normally have a cadre of chaplains to meet installation needs. While there are only a few chaplains per 100 personnel, this is dense coverage. Chaplains also have unfettered access to troops. That means the chaplain can always be right there when military personnel are most vulnerable. They're even expected to be there in times of stress and loss. Chaplains are expected to impose themselves in times of greatest need. This includes deployment briefings, suicide counseling, relationship and marriage retreats, and just weekly, weekly religious services. This all makes sense. This is also far above the basic constitutional basis for which chaplaincy uh, to provide the free exercise of religion, as decided by the legal case Catcock v. Marsh in 1985. So we have a chaplaincy with the ear of the commander, mandate to push their services and argu arguably their beliefs on all military personnel at any time, and a chaplaincy with physical buildings, free advertising, budget for materials, a full-time salary staff and staff, and an expectation that they provide for all military personnel. Yet, as I have noted, that is not happening. An, alter, uh, an alternative view of the chaplaincy is one in which chaplains are entirely passive, providing services only from installation support activities, never having free reign to push themselves on others, and no ear to the command. This would be a chaplaincy that would provide for constitutional free exercise of religion, but have none of the other resources, advisory services, ethical advice, staff administration, or other responsibilities chaplains have now. So the problem with changing the status of chaplains is some, op some officer of some sort must fill in all those other secular services, general counseling, grief support, deployment counseling, suicide counseling, marriage counseling, and relationship retreats, maintaining and scheduling religious services at the shared use building, scheduling and scheduling services around religious holidays and activities, giving morale and moral advice to the commander. The chaplain is expected to perform all of these sectors. Some touch on religion or are specifically faith-based in their execution, but the scheduling and facilitation of these activities are all secular activities. If the chaplain does not perform those duties, who will? The chaplaincy duties cannot go away, so reform is the first and best alternative. However, the chaplaincy, their faith endorsers and their lobbyists and advocates in Congress will decide if chaplains will accept the mission or decline in favor of what is comfortable for them. So we need a certain policy 
uh, to look at this. Um, and there are a number of things here. Humanist identity is really the easiest one. Simply follow up on a 2017 memorandum uh, in March 2017, and that added humans to the list of religious services. And you know, I'll go go over and cover. There's this slide that I, I skipped over a little bit for time, but we may go through and, and read that one a little bit in more detail about humanist identity. Um, second thing is chaplaincy for humanists. Again, providing all of these services. You know, this is a long list of things that chaplains do. It's not just counseling or confidential counseling. It's a long list of things chaplains do to advise the command and provide for service members. And it's not the kind of thing service members can avoid. That should be Christians provide those services to Jews, and every chaplain should provide those services to humanists as well. And then uh, if, if they're not willing to do that, there has to be some really significant reform. And all of this, the best way to stop proselytism, evangelism, abuses by the chain of command is to, to really reform the chaplaincy. Because the chaplains are the ones that advise those commanders about what right looks like. And they're expected to step in when the commander is overreaching their boundaries. And the chaplains themselves, honestly, are the ones who overreach their boundaries the most and cause most of these problems. So a chaplaincy that understands itself, polices itself, and really is a profession um, that, that can do the right thing is, is what, what is needed most. So these are the kind of history and policy that we're talking about. And then uh, Jason's going to take over now and talk about, um, talk about how best to, to discuss that. And Jason Torpy, if you don't mind muting yourself so we can minimize background noise while Jason Lemieux. Okay, thank you so much. Well, thanks, Jason. Uh, and welcome, everybody. Um, I, I, you know, Jason gave a really great, Jason Torpy, um, you know, just gave a great presentation about inclusion, inclusion of humanists into the Chaplain Corps. And, you know, um, Center for Inquiry and MAF are working closely on that issue. Um, I tried to design this to be my portion of this presentation to, to apply to, you know, any advocacy that you that you might want to do um, or that, you know, might you think might benefit military service members or, you know, whether they're non-theists or anybody else. Um, so just to sort of say quickly, and, and also I just, you know, up front I, I may jump around the slides a little bit, jump around between slides or jump around within bullet points within a single slide. So um, please bear with me if that happens. Um, but just to sort of say up front, you know, when we are asking ourselves, what is freedom of speech? What does it mean? What does it mean to express a political viewpoint? Um, you know, I just wanted to start by saying that political expression can be almost anything, any idea that a person could express about how society should organize or elements of society should organize or a government should operate or run, um, or, you know, what government should do. Um, everybody, you know, we're, we, everybody understands when they join the U.S. military that they are voluntarily accepting certain restrictions on, their, on these freedoms that most people enjoy, or that, you know, that we enjoy under the Constitution of the United States and the First Amendment. Um, I think the, the culture can sort of spread a meme that you um, surrender all of your rights when you join the military, and that's not true. Um, you do, you accept certain limitations, but you don't completely give up your right to freedom of speech. And in fact, um, I, I, I didn't put this on the slide, but just to, just to um, read from Department of Defense policy directly, it's, it's Department of Defense policy that a service member's right of expression should be preserved to the maximum maximum extent possible in accordance with um, the Constitution and law, and that is consistent with good order and discipline and national security. So that's to say that you know, while there are definitely restrictions that need to be taken for members of the military that you know have a national security responsibility, it's Department of Defense policy that service members should be allowed as much at freedom of expression. As, as can be allowed while still having a functioning military and observing the law and, and staying in accordance with the Constitution. So all that is to say that um, there are a few there are a few general rules that are they're hard and fast rules 
um, times that you know you, you basically you, you cannot engage in any form of political speech. Uh, so for if you're in the if you're a, a member of the military, generally speaking, you can only engage in political expression if you are off the off base. You are not on a military facility. You are not on duty, and you are not wearing a, a military uniform. Uh, so you have to be you have to be taking all of these steps to completely physically remove yourself from any representation of the U.S. military or the U.S. government. Also, um, if you are stationed overseas, if you're not stationed in the United States, you cannot engage in any political demonstration off base. You can never engage in any political activity in a foreign country, um, whether it's about that country's policy or U.S. policy or a third country, you can't do it. So, you know, if you're on base in a foreign country, you can write your member of Congress. You can you can express your political views in that very specific way that the Constitution has provided for us. But you but you cannot go off base and you know try to organize or advocate. So, um, you know, before we go into some some more specifics about you know types of expression that service members can engage in. Um, I, I just want to make sure that we just say up front that um, there, uh, there, are, there are laws on the books that protect whistleblowers in the military. There are laws to protect service members from being retaliated against for making a lawful communication with their representatives or for engaging in a permitted expression of their, of their views. So if, if a commander punishes you for doing something, for saying something that you, you, were, you were obeying all the rules, you were totally within your rights to say, um, that's known as reprisal, and that's illegal. The law protects service members from reprisal. But as we all know, um, you know military commanders have very, very broad authority. They, can, they have the ability to make decisions that affect um, many aspects of service members' lives outside of you know, just the strict professional duties of their job that, that, that would exist in a civilian job. So, you know, there's always a judgment call that an individual is going to have to make. You have to ask yourself, we all have to ask ourselves, um, you know, not only what do I believe, but um, why is it important to me to express this? And, you know, am I permitted to express this? And, you know, what are the possible repercussions? What are the different ways? Jason, you just cut out. Um, really can, you, can you actually just pedal back and start um, at where you were saying there? I think the sentence was there are many different ways. So just pedal back like ten or fifteen seconds. Um, there are there are many different ways that commanders. I think this is what I was saying. I have many different ways that commanders. You know, there are many decisions that that commanders can make. Authority that they have to influence a lot of aspects of every service member's life. Um, they have broad authority to enforce good order and discipline, and they ne and they have to use their own judgment when they're implementing good order and discipline, right? So, so as individuals, you know, we have to ask ourselves what our views are, and we have to ask ourselves, you know, um, what's the right venue, and is this the right moment, and do I, you know, and 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 um, sorry, I'm just getting a message from somebody. That um, yeah, to ask ourselves what are the possible repercussions of, of saying this and develop a plan. So if you believe that you've been retaliated against, if you've been the victim of reprisal for, uh, for a permitted expression of speech, um, there's guidance on the Department of Defense Inspector General website. So, and just to sort of say a word about inspector generals it may not be clear what they are to everybody but they're generally a part of a a part of a government agency where the leader the inspector general who actually leads this department is has some um freedom to investigate abuses and violations of policy and violations of the law that happen within that organization so this is what the department of defense inspector general is for you is it's this person who they are their job is to find you know events like a reprisal that you might be um, the victim of. So we strongly encourage you to go on the DoD website, and we can make the link available um, later. 
after the presentation if that's helpful for anybody. And also, um, MAFs frequently ask questions on their website, um, have more to say about harassment and about how you can respond to it and what to expect. So with that, I'll go ahead and get in. Um, the first thing to say is, in terms of expressing our views to people who have power to directly influence policy and to you know, pass laws that um, require the Department of Defense to you know, take steps to be inclusive to humanists, for example, um, make sure that you are speaking to the member of Congress or the members, you know, the, the representative and the senators who actually represent you. Um, I think that some people, I've seen people have an impression that um, all members of Congress are sort of equally interested in what every citizen has to say, and that's really not true. They really, members of Congress really mainly want to hear from their constituents. So you can go on whoismyrepresentative.com, enter in your zip code and figure out who that is. Um, and then, you know, then you can share your views. The first thing to do is make clear every time that you are speaking is your personal capacity. These are your personal views. You do not represent your unit. You do not represent the military, your branch, or the Department of Defense. Um, once you've done that, when you're speaking to a, a member of Congress or you're speaking to policymakers, you can you can feel free to be concise because they are are hearing things like this from people all day long. Um, they're very used to getting things in a sort of bullet point soundbite format. Um, so don't feel like you need to really elaborate and give a lot of detail because they, they, they will sort of, to the extent that you're their constituent, the fact that you believe it is, is a good enough reason for them to listen. You don't have to justify yourself. Try to stay focused on a single issue at a time. So when you call, you know, if you call your member of Congress after the webinar um, and tell them that, you know, you think it's important that the US military include humanists and provide equal services, equal chaplain services for its humanist and non-theist service members. Um, you should just stick your stick to just that issue on that one phone call. And if you have other views, which you know we all, a lot of us have views on a lot of different subjects, um, but you should sort of make that another call. You should you sort of leave that for another day and speak about that issue on its own too, uh, because the member of Congress has staff who just handle one specific issue or one set of issues. And so if you call up and you and you speak about different things, it's very hard for them to, to sort of process what they're hearing from you because the staff aren't organized that way. Always, always, always be polite, no matter who you're talking to. If, if you, even if you, you know, think that the person on the other end of the communication is not being polite or respectful to you, always be polite. Remember that your, our political opponents are always looking for an opportunity to sort of highlight bad behavior from the other side. Um, people who are sort of reluctant to help, members of Congress who, you know, they have an obligation to serve their constituents, but if they're reluctant, um, you know, being rude doesn't, doesn't help motivate them. So we're trying to give them every reason, every reason to want to help us. Um, and Another key thing to keep in mind is that even though service members have a right to communicate with their members of Congress, that doesn't mean that anything we say to a member of Congress is protected or privileged information. It's not. Um, just, just to give out one, like the most obvious example, classified information is classified information. You know, you have to have a right to know. Um, even if there's a classified information that's like relevant to the issue that you are discussing, well, it's still illegal to share it over an unsecured channel. Um, so, you know, just keep in mind that the, there are limits um, in terms of things that are unsafe or illegal to talk about. Um, and this, this is actually Jason Torpy's recommendation, but um, The Citizen Lobbyist by Amanda Kanif is a really good book that breaks down step-by-step -step ways to um, advocate for an issue and um, make yourself, make, make the best use of you know, your own skills and organize with other people who, who share your views too. So some quick don'ts. Um, I'm, I'm willing to bet we've all seen a one or two pictures uh, on, you know, one news website or another of a member of the military wearing a uniform, often a dress uniform, on stage at a political event like a campaign rally. Um, I think we all know that's illegal, but just to say it again, just because some people appear to be getting away with doing that 
doesn't make it okay. It's always illegal. Um, those people are are hurting their cause because people who understand the limits of military service see what they're doing and they see that it's illegal. And so they're just undermining the credibility of their message anyway. And they are always liable. They are always at risk for um, you know being prosecuted under the Uniform Code of Military Justice for that. So um, don't join that club, which you know I don't think anybody will, but just to reiterate it. And again, a reminder, you know, before you express uh, your political viewpoint, make sure that you consider what are the possibility for reprisal and what would I do if that were to happen. So I will skip to, um, so everything that I just said was for speaking to a member of Congress um, or, you know, a policymaker in general about an issue that faces the country. But if you have a specific problem where um, if a government agency's processes are failing you or you've been treated unfairly or if, you know, in the military case, if you've, if you've been abused or you have been had your rights violated in some way um, in violation of, of policy, and if your chain of command is not able to resolve that issue and if the inspector general can't resolve that issue, um, a member of Congress has the authority to inquire, to make an in, to open investigation, and to advocate on your behalf uh, by acting as a liaison to that government agency. So a lot of times, just mere, just merely getting a phone call from a member of Congress is enough to sort of motivate an agency to um, resolve a case. Just to give you an, uh, an easy example to, to sort of another, you know, to make sense of is the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, people apply for veterans benefits and their application gets lost. It's been five years. They still haven't heard a decision. Um, a lot of times what can make the difference is a call from their member of Congress. Hey, how come he hasn't gotten a, an answer? It's been five years. And then magically he gets an answer next week. Now, it doesn't always work like that. There's no guarantee. Um, but if we give our member of Congress every opportunity to help us, then they oftentimes can do that. They can make a difference. So the first thing to say about that is, Exhaust your options for relief within the military. First, you know, everybody knows that we are to go through our chain of command first and foremost. All the way through the chain of command, if that still does not get the issue resolved, then we go to the Office of Inspector General for the, for the um, military service that we are in. Always be able to say to your member of Congress that you have taken those steps and be able to prove it, you know. Um, you know, have the date that you made the phone call and have the, con you know, be able to relay the contents of that conversation to them so that they can help you with your case. And always tell them the truth, give them all the facts, you know, even the inconvenient facts because they, they need this stuff. If they get blindsided later because there was something important that, that, they, that you didn't tell them, then they, they can't help you. And it just, it, it, it makes it so much harder for them. So tell them the truth and also Try to make the most effort that we can to document your case as you go along. So when you, you know, if you reach out to your chain of command um, and they don't take you seriously at first or you get dismissed, you know, just make a quick note about the date that that happened and who was the member of the chain of command um, and be recording things as they happen. Because then it's, it's just, it's, it looks impressive and it's also really going to be helpful when they are asking you these questions later and they want to know all the steps that you went through. Um, and if you've forgotten important details because of just so much that's happened and it could have happened over a period of months or years. And again, be polite. Um, we're trying to, and even if, even if your member of Congress is in the, is, is, disagrees with all of your views politically, like even if you and them don't have a lot of overlap politically, they still are your member of Congress to help you with that federal agency. So we want to give, be extremely polite and respectful in this circumstance. And because we want the, the constituent services person who is advocating to that government agency, we want them to go the extra mile. We don't want them to just check the boxes because it's very, very easy for them to check the boxes and say that they made the, the honest effort, um, but not really show the kind of urgency that is going to really move the people in the agency to action. 
So um, really quickly, I just wanted to sort of go over a quick sample call script um, because I think that it's calling your member of Congress is, is, is pretty easy and simple, but I think that um, it can seem complicated or it can seem like people don't you don't know what to expect or um, you're not sure if that if they're going to challenge you or what kind of information they want from you. So just to say up front, um, a member of Congress or their staff who answers the phone is not supposed to argue with you. So it, that's not to say that arguments never happen. Um, but when you're calling a member of Congress, you, 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 don't ha you shouldn't have to prepare for a debate. That's not what it is. No matter whether your member of Congress agrees with you on an issue or not, it's important for them to know you as a constituent. And if you're talking about the US military, it's important for them to know that you are a service member and so that you've got personal experience with this issue. So as long as we're off duty, we're off base, we're out of uniform, um, you know, we're, we're, we, we're looking and acting and behaving um, like a civilian would, we can just pick up the phone. We can in, um, call, a, there's a congressional hotline which we can provide after this if it's helpful to people. Um, and they will put you through to your member of Congress with your zip code. And then, you know, when, when somebody in the member's office picks up, you just say, hi, I'm John Doe. My zip code is 12345. That's just make sure that they know that you are, in fact, their constituent. And then it can be just very simple and straightforward. Uh, I'm, I'm currently a member of the US uh, serving in the United States Marine Corps. I'm speaking, I'm calling right now to speak in my personal capacity. I'm not, you know, I don't represent the, the Department of Defense right now. But I urge, um, I urge Representative Jane Doe to support full pastoral care and you know full chaplain services for humanists and non-theists who are in the military. Non-theistic service members deserve the same access to the emotional and spiritual and pastoral support that the military provides to everybody. Uh, and thank you so much for your time. That's all you have to say. They'll write that down, and you know if they're doing their job, they'll pass that up to your member of Congress. Um, so I know we're going to turn it over to questions here in a moment, and I just wanted to before before I. Um, wrap up. Just encourage everybody. Um, please feel free. You can use this script itself after the call if you want. Right now, you can call your member of Congress and just raise this issue to their attention, um, because this isn't sort of the sort of issue that's in the headlines every day. So just the fact that you call up and say this is important to me, that itself is really important information. Your member of Congress may not actually know that this is an issue that anybody that any of their constituents care about. So, so a, a call as, as simple and as general as this is valuable. And if down the line you get an action alert from Center for Inquiry or MAF or any other organization, and it gives you a more specific, you know, please tell your member of Congress to vote against this or to hold this hearing, um, you know, you can, you know, you should definitely feel free to include that detail when you have it. But if you don't, it's enough to tell them this is issue. This issue is important to me, and I will be watching to see how you respond to this. And with that, I think it is time to go ahead and turn it over to questions. And um, Sarah Levin, did you were you going to jump in or? Yeah, yeah. I wanted to first of all thank okay. you both. Um, that was a great presentation. I learned a lot. Um, I have not seen anyone type any questions, so I want to kind of give folks a a second to. Look at that chat box and and type something in if you have something. No questions. All right. Well, you see the slides here. We have the contact information for Jason Lemieux, for Jason Tarpy, and myself. Um, so if you do think of questions later on. Um, or if you do uh, follow up on uh, Jason Lemieux's call to action and make a phone call today and want to tell us how it went or if it maybe um, made you, you know, think about some other actions you might want to run by us down the road because you're excited to advocate, that's great. Um, but otherwise, um, we will um, make these slides available. Uh, we really appreciate you all participating today. Um, and we hope that we've been inspiring you to... Uh, confidently advocate. Oh, was there anything else, sir? Go ahead. We do have a question. Uh, it says, do retired military members need to give a similar statement? I'll pass that over to Jason Lemieux to answer. 
So that is an excellent question. Um, I will have to get back to to you, um, Brian, with with an answer to that, a, a more specific answer. Um, I I'm not I, I'm not really sure about legally where retired officers stand. Um, I guess retired service members. Um, you know, certainly it's advisable to give the statement to just, you know, it, 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 it I, I think it would show, you know, it shows that you are concerned about, you know, your integrity and about speaking for yourself and about not representing something that's not, you know, that you don't have the right or that you don't have the authority to represent. Um, I think it definitely looks good and it helps, you know, set the tone um, and show that you're a professional and that you have credibility. Um, but I'll have to get back to you on exactly the, what the legal status uh, is with regard to that. Yeah, and I'll add that um, retired service members retain an authority to wear their uniform, and that authority to wear the un wear the uniform is for kind of military stuff. Um, and it would, at least for myself, I think it would be inappropriate to have you wearing the uniform at an event, you know, when it's your right, you know, because of your military service. So it, it, it sends the wrong message. We wouldn't want the other side. You know, we don't like it when the other side does that. And a lot of these things, you know, you see Christians getting away with it. It's the kind of thing they'll um, prosecute us for when they'll just overlook it when their friendly Christians do it. Um, so we don't get away with it as much as they would. And, and to be honest, I wouldn't want uh, a retired service member, even though they're authorized to wear the uniform, to do that at some sort of uh, um, official event. So. You know, we'd rather err on the side of just, you know, just give the statement. It doesn't hurt. I can't imagine it would matter if you're just talking on the phone or something. Um, but uh, it's, as Jason said, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt to spend another 10 seconds um, saying, hey, it's just my personal thing. I'm not calling for the Department of Defense, but I am you know, retired. I was there for a long time, and my experience matters. Oh, it looks like we might have another question from Michael Watson. He just said he just said thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Michael, for participating. Um, any other questions? Yeah, as, as people, you know, in case anybody thinks of questions, just I'm sure Sarah will say we'll we'll, we'll get these slides up. Um, Map will put them out. They'll be posted at probably a couple of different, you know, CFI, SCA, and Map. We'll get the, the video up. Um, we'll probably put up the slides first so people can kind of follow up and read uh, what's going on. But uh, I appreciate everybody being here as well. Great. Any any last thoughts from either of you before we wrap up? Um, no, 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 nothing for me specifically. Just you know, thank you so much to um, everybody who attended, and thanks Sarah and Jason for uh, for presenting the webinar with me. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. All right, have a great week, everybody. You too.